Construction by configuration. The future of software engineering. A 47-minute presentation held at the Whitworth Conference Centre, Shrivenham, on the 15th of May, 2006. The speaker is Professor Ian Somerville of the University of St Andrews. He wrote and has maintained the definitive work on software engineering. Professor Ian Somerville. Of course I'm not going to talk about the future of software engineering. I'm going to talk about a future of software engineering because one of the things we know is that there is not an answer for software engineering. There is not one right way of doing things, one true way that we should be following and everything should follow that way. We know that we need a diversity of approaches for different domains, for different types of software. But I'm going to talk about what I think is an increasingly important approach to software engineering, which is where we do not develop software from scratch using traditional programming languages, but where we actually configure existing systems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences in observing a fairly large project which tried to do this. I'll talk about the successes and the failures of that. And I'll highlight a number of issues that I think the community has to address to put this approach to software engineering on a fairly sound footing in a way in which we can actually lower the risk of this development style. This is a conventional V model of software engineering. Vs don't fit very nicely in horizontal slides. So essentially it's the software life cycle as publicized originally in the early 70s, where we go through the process of specification, design, development, integration, etc., etc. This is the approach to software engineering that is still very, very widely used. However, I think that's changing. I think in commercial software development, it has already changed. Software reuse, which people have been talking about for many, many years, is a major success story. In spite of what some ignorant academics say, which say it isn't practiced very much. For business systems, software reuse is how software is developed now by and large. It's based around large-scale software use, ERP systems, extensive reuse of libraries and code which is already in existence, and frameworks such as J2EE. Fine-grain reuse, where you actually reuse down at the individual component level, is used in all sorts of software development, not just in application system development. And I believe that this approach will become the norm for all types of system, including embedded and real-time systems. Embedded and real-time systems are the last bastion of traditional software engineering. But I think that that's going to change over the next 10 years. Now, software reuse, again, is not something that's homogeneous. There are all sorts of different approaches to software reuse that are practiced. There's the component-based software engineering as exemplified by the large-scale frameworks like that support Java or Microsoft's .NET and its evolution or its instantiation as service-oriented systems which is seen as the next generation of components. I'm not going to be talking about these so if you haven't come across these it doesn't really matter. There's the notion of system families where we take some kind of generic system and we produce instantiations of that for different customers by adapting in different ways but by reusing a common core of functionality. There's ERP systems, systems such as SAP, Oracle, etc, etc, enterprise resource planning systems where we have very large scale domain specific modules such as an inventory control module that are particularized, that are adapted for use in a particular company circumstances. These are perhaps the most widely used instance of reuse in major companies. Virtually all major companies make use of this class of system for much of their application system development, prompted to some extent by the year 2000 problem. We need to change and by and largely change from their old COBOL systems to ERP systems. And there's vertical software development based around existing packages. And this is what I'm going to focus on today, the vertical software development and the issues and problems that arise from that approach to software reuse. Now, the argument why reuse, there's lots of principles, there's lots of positives about reuse. Faster time to deployment, you get your systems working and out there more quickly and earning for you. You have a lower management risk. 
that is you know the software is already there you don't, you're not starting from scratch you have lower costs because you have faster time to deployment you have less effort involved in the development higher dependability the software is tried and tested you haven't got some untried system which you're trying to work and you have more management control of the procurement process I think this is in some ways the most important element of the why reuse or why it has become particularly dominant in that it's taken control away from the techies and actually management can now deal with the providers directly without actually going into the technicalities. In practice I think it's fair to say that all of these can happen I guess there's not that many circumstances where all of them do happen but there's quite a lot of circumstances where some of them do happen so essentially in principle reuse is a mechanism it has tremendous potential but I believe that there's actually lots of problems associated with it which we need some deep thought how to address one reason for benefit of reuse is that our level of abstraction changes Instead of thinking about low-level elements, as exemplified in programming languages, objects and things like that, we actually have domain-specific abstractions, equipment, schedules, locations, suppliers, or whatever. And we can adapt and tailor these to our particular circumstances. So they change the focus of system construction from an implementation technology to a business focused technology and that's clearly one of the attractions of the general approach now when we reuse we rarely if ever reuse these domain abstractions without change these domain abstractions are abstractions and abstractions by their very nature are generic when we want to instantiate these in any context we need to make them particular to that context we need to configure them to adapt them to whatever the local circumstances of use. Now, this configuration can actually take a whole range, a spectrum of activities. It can be something very simple, like setting the number of terminals in your system. I want to configure this system to communicate with 200 terminals or 600 terminals or whatever. Or it can be incredibly complex, where we have to define business rules, develop special purpose components, etc, etc. As well as this, and critically, configuring the process is very important. All of the evidence suggests that reuse doesn't work if in circumstances where organizations are unwilling to change the process. The process has to be configured, it has to adapt to the software. People have to change the way they work. Now, that is widely criticised. Why should people change? Well, the reason why people should change is because they're adaptable. They're actually very good at change, and that's the most cost-effective way to do it, rather than to try and change the software to fit the people. So there, there are very good reasons why people should change. But it's very important, this configuration of the process. This is not simply a technical issue. It's a socio-technical issue where we're configuring the process, the people, as well as the technical system. When I talk about configuration, I mean two things really. Customization to an operational environment, to the business environment, but also adaptation to an execution environment, to this particular platform, to a particular technical platform that the software is operating on. And this can mean lots of different things. It can mean reflecting the specific needs of a customer, such as a hospital. So that we have many different, if you take a piece of software, medical software, hospitals all have their own ways of working. They're not homogeneous. So you need to configure it for the hospital. Then you need to go down a level and you need to configure it to the particular part of the hospital in which it's being installed and used. The requirements of accident and emergency are radically different from the requirements of geriatrics. So it isn't a question of saying one size fits all, here's the XYZ Royal Infirmary system. You need to then adapt it to the particular function within that hospital. It needs to be configured to interact with existing systems. We very rarely, uh, virtually never now, put systems into an empty environment. There are always other systems there that we need to interact with. And we need to configure it to the particular operational platform in which it's executing. So there's lots of different types of configuration that we need to do and configuration takes different forms depending on the approach to reuse. So 
components and services, the configuration is done with glue code. We actually write bits of program to glue the different components together. System families, typically we actually take bits of the code again and modify it to fit an environment. And then ERP systems and generic systems are designed for configuration. So they have particular mechanisms built into them which allow them to be configured without access to the source code of the system. And this, of course, causes its own problems, which I'll come on to later. I'm going to talk about COTS-based reuse, where we have a system in a specific application domain, and the particular system I'm going to talk about is a patient information system, which was installed to support outpatient clinics in a hospital. So what we have here is generic functionality, a system which knows about patients, which knows about appointments, which knows about clinics, etc., etc., and that is then adapted to the environment in which it's being installed. The system is designed for this adaptation. The configuration opportunities are built into the system, which of course is one of the disadvantages. Because when you have to write programs, when you have to write code, you have a lot of flexibility in how you configure. When you don't, when you have to work with whatever the, the designer of the software has thought you will have to configure, you then have got a different kind of problem. But remember this is a long term process. Rob will know that the current Spanish en route traffic control system is being reconfigured for use in the UK. And it's not quite as simple as just changing a few parameters. I think it was, is it six or seven year process? And then not writing the software from scratch. So it, this is a big process. So the kind of things we do, we need to select the functionality. We need to define the data model. What's the specific organisation of the data in a context? Define the business rules. There's a whole range of things. Configuration is not a simple process. It's actually a whole range of different processes, a whole range of different things, dealing with a wide range of different stakeholders to discover what they need in order to configure the system in a state where it can be deployed in that environment. The particular system which we've studied, and this is part of a project which I've been involved in for some years on, on system dependability, was a patient information system. And we studied it in the context of a, a mental health clinic, or clinics rather, it was used across the city in Edinburgh. And this was built on top of a generic system which has been quite widely used in other hospitals. It hadn't been used in Scotland before. I believe it was used by one of the current suppliers for the National Health Information System. That, that was a supplier. It had been relatively widely used in English hospitals, but hadn't been used in Scotland. Now, Scotland is different. It has its own legal system, which is distinct, often in subtle ways, from the English system. It has devolved responsibility for certain functions, including healthcare. So that the targets and priorities set in Scotland for healthcare are not necessarily the same as those set in England. And I'll come back to this, because this was one of the issues that arose in this system. Why did they decide to go down this route? Well, those of you who have had any involvement with healthcare will know that there is a continuing tension in hospitals between the management and the clinicians. Different people think they run the hospital, the doctors think they run the hospital, and the managers think they run the hospital. And this particular system allowed the managers to actually control how information was recorded. They saw it as an opportunity to wrest power from the clinicians. One of the reasons why they wanted to do that was because of the kind of healthcare funding that we have, which is target based. So you have to hit a particular target to get a particular level of funding. And in Scotland, the hospitals were faced with a very tight deadline to produce a reporting system which would allow them to report against this set of targets which had been produced by the executive. And like all targets, these are ones that are kind of pulled out of the air and it's never very clear why they have a particular target, why three months rather than four months or whatever. Essentially, there was very little time to do a detailed comparison of alternatives. So the procurement process was not along the lines, well, let's look at all possible patient information systems we could use. We'll go through a coherent and constructive process of selecting ones. It was, this one looks as if it'll do, and we can deliver in time to get our systems up and running for the next financial year. So there was a management decision to buy this system with relatively little clinical consultation. The software engineering that was part of it 
involved a number of configuration activities. The data model had to be configured for a particular set of clinics. So clinics recorded different information about patients. Mental health recorded different information than physiotherapy, for example. So that had to be adapted and configured. The menus whereby particular pieces of information had to be adapted for each clinic. The reports which were produced by the system for management had to be designed and configured into the system. And the rules that apply to the system data had to be understood and configured. And that understanding process was not immediately obvious how to do that because these rules were coming from different places. So there was a range of configuration activities and quite a lot of problems. The system was supposed to be up and running in 2002. It's sort of running now, but it's by no means delivering the kind of functionality which was promised, I think, when the procurement process started in around about 2000. There was a real problem with objectives conflict. That is, the management objective was to provide reports according to whatever headings the executive produced. And the clinical objectives were to record patient information according to clinical classification. And it was thought initially that these were congruent. And in fact, they were really quite diverse. What management wanted and what the doctors wanted were quite different things. So there was a long period of discussion and negotiation about what exactly the system should record about the patients. There was particular problems about the configurability of the system. And this is where we come back to the difference between Scots and English law. Because the system, recall, was used in mental health care and part of that was to cover the rules for sectioning patients, that is patients who were in, locked up without their consent because they were seen as a danger to themselves or others, particularly others. Locking up people without consent is something which we try not to do in this country. And consequently, there was an extensive, in both Scotland and England, there is an extensive review process when someone is sectioned. That has to be reviewed very regularly, and the sectioning order has to be reapplied, essentially, otherwise if people are released. I, I don't know the details of, of this review process, but I do know that the language that they used for writing the rules was insufficiently expressive to cover the process in Scotland. So essentially, the system could not be configured to support the sectioning process in Scotland. In England, it was used in such a way that, it, it, let's say for the sake of argument, it was every three months it had to be reviewed. After every two months, it started producing warnings that you had to review this case. It was, it was unable to do so in Scotland, and that's one part of the system that has never worked properly in that. It that is, remains a completely manual process. And this took quite a long time to discover this. This, of course, is not something that is immediately obvious when you try and do it. It's something that people, and, and the clinical people, were, of course, expecting it. Significantly, failure to configure the process was a major issue because clinics in different parts of the city or in different hospitals had their own processes. So they carried on using their own processes with this system, which meant that a patient with a particular condition might have it recorded in one way in one hospital and in a different way in a different hospital. And this caused quite a lot of problems with patients who had mental problems because, first of all, you often couldn't ask them what did they say when you came the last time, right? Because they had no idea. They, they were inconsistent in their use of the clinic. So they would go to one clinic one time, they would wander around the city, many of them, essentially, visiting clinics on a random basis. So they meant the information about that patient became very, very inconsistent. So these major issues, conflict objectives, problems of configuration, of the expressibility of the configuration, and failure to configure the process caused significant delays in this process. And what we see is that in configuration and configuring systems, the distinction between specification, design and development is very blurred. A lot of the process becomes, only becomes possible once you start to use the system. You realise its strengths and its weaknesses. There's no point in writing a specification to say the system shall do X when there's no 
way the system will ever do X, that is, you have to explore its possibilities and adapt to what the system can do. So consequently, the notion of having a completely configured system that's then delivered is one which doesn't happen. It doesn't happen with any software, actually, because, I mean, software obviously changes. But much more so, there are things that are left to the consultations with the end user to do that configuration. Another difficulty with lots of programs is you can't turn off the configurability. So they're designed to be configurable, which is great. Okay? But sometimes you really don't want that because the users then, or those users who consider themselves to be technically skilled, then start to tinker with the system. And certainly you find that a number of doctors, a proportion of doctors, consider themselves to be computer whizzies. So they love to tinker with systems. It actually means they don't have to talk to patients. So you get all this uncontrolled configuration. So what you think what's there one week is something different the following week. And you, you need to configure expectations. People have very high expectations. Here's this new system. And as with all software, it's never that good. So what do we see? Well, we very much saw a two-stage requirements process. Instead of requirements process be, the requirements process being a continuum where kind of high-level requirements are, are decomposed and developed into more detailed system requirements, we saw a quite clear break between let's find the general requirements. Okay, we need to record base information about patients. It needs to run on this platform, etc., etc. And that is used as the basis of making a choice we will buy this particular package. And then there's this much more detailed process where you go into the, the, the settings, the environment where the system will be deployed and identify the specific requirements. There didn't seem to be any notion of actually going out into the user environment at an early stage and understanding its limitations. Primarily, as I say, because this was driven by the need to meet targets rather than actually serve users. One of the things we did see, and I think this was actually quite positive, is there was quite a lot of co-design of the process and the software. That is, once people realised they were stuck with this, they said, well, we have to make the best of it. And they participated in the process. They, they were actually quite positive about active participation in the process, becoming involved in the development process. They didn't want to say, this is what I want, come back when you've got it. They were actually willing to discuss and negotiate, partly because I think they could see something there from an early stage. Actually, they, they could see the possibilities of the system. And then the real problem, which is testing. Testing is enormously difficult for this class of system. Testing is difficult when you don't have a specification, so you're not, not sure what you're testing against. But it's even more difficult when you don't know the possibilities, when you don't know that what the the system is essentially the, the range of possibilities undocumented in the system. I'll come back to testing. And then good practice, good software engineering practice, practice which we know for other classes of system is essential, like configuration management, reviews, are practically impossible to implement because of the nature of the system. So these are, these are the, what we observed in, the, in this particular process. And if we look at the choice... I think this is a, the first statement. I, I mean, the first statement is, is, a, is rather broad, uh, but it's something which we've seen in, a num in, in quite a number of circumstances. That is, it's not a detailed analysis of the requirements in a specific setting that's driving the choice of system. It's all sorts of other issues, political issues, platform issues, availability of expertise, and straight prejudice. We've had one of these systems before. It was no good. We're not having one again. So there's much more, I think, there's more politicisation of the process, of the, of the procurement process, than in other classes of system. And of course, the procurement process is a political process in any class of system. It, it's not driven solely by technical means. But in, for, for, this, for COT systems, the possibilities of excluding the technicians become even greater. Co-design, I think, is a positive but there's all sorts of compromises that are essential. This is where I come down to one of the problems we, we saw was that we didn't, the expectations of the users were not managed. 
So when you have this class of system, there's a need to manage expectations. It can do a bit of what you want, but it isn't perfect. It's not going to deliver everything you want. So you simply have to go through a series of negotiations to discover the essential rather than the accidental. Because lots and lots of requirements and systems are accidental. They're, this is the way we do things, so that's a requirement. Okay? And the way we do things is just happens to be the way things evolved. You could go to another setting which do similar things, a different hospital, and they do it in a different way, and they would come up with different requirements. These are simply accidental. There are, of course, essential requirements. When you have a patient, you need to know their name. Okay? It's pretty hard to work without that. Although, in accident emergency, you have to live without it for some time, sometimes. And I think configurability makes this co-design process. So in principle, I think you have the possibility of actually having better user satisfaction with these systems than you have in a more conventional process where user expectations tend to be raised by the fact that they read these requirements that think, this, well, this is really good, I'll, be, I'll expect this. And then they find it's not quite that good at all. And then testing. Classic approach to testing is to actually have a set of te design a set of tests, design a way of running these automatically, and you run these tests against your system and you look for anomalies that come from them. These systems, COT systems, are simply not designed for running that set of tests. So how can you test them cost effectively in a systematic way? There's no specification, so you can't hive off the testing to technical people. Because remember, most testing is not done by users, most testing of, of our systems, it's done by technical people who have a specification say the system ought to do X, does it do X? Okay. Here the only kind of testing you can have is user testing. But your users are busy. Your users actually don't want to be bothered with testing. You know, They're, they're, they're seeing patients or, or something like that. So there's this immense testing problem that you, your system goes in there and it, you know it isn't what you want, but you have no way of actually determining in advance how to check if it meets the needs of the users. It also comes down to not testing is the system right, but is it the right system? Because in many cases, the system is not technically, it does not behave in a way which is technically incorrect. It just behaves in a way that doesn't fit a particular environment of use. So it's again, you can't get away from actually working with the users of the system in order to test it. So testing is one of these real problems with this approach to development. We have the problems of evolution. The configuration process often starts with consultants employed by or employed in conjunction with the manufacturer that are the supplier of the system. So there are lots of people making significant sums of money being SAP consultants. And then there's a handover. At some stage, the consultants hand it over to the local IT staff. There's a change of ownership of the system. It's often the case that they are managers rather than software engineers or system administrators or something. So they have quite a lot of problems in dealing with the evolution of the system. They don't have the technical expertise to actually do the configuration themselves and they don't have the time to learn how to do it. So they, it evolves itself for a while and then it kind of stops dead because this, we've reached that handover stage. There's these problems of change management which I talked about. How do you actually control changes in a system like that? when the system is designed to be configurable, and you have people who, essentially, you can't sack if they decide to muck around with your system. Because you can't go to your consultant and say, you've changed the system, out. They're in a position of power, which is such that they have... They can essentially do what they like, because they can always make the argument, this is for clinical need. And managers find that very difficult because if the newspapers pick it up, you know, they they've got, haven't got a leg to stand on. So consultants know they have a lot of power and they use it very effectively. So what we, you see is this increasing entropy. The bits of the system start to diverge as they get configured in different ways. So we have evolution outside the control of the system owners. 
And here are the kind of problems. I'm kind of my story about the the PIM system is coming to an end. And I want to talk now about how do we address this problem? I think this is actually a very good way of constructing software. I don't want to make any bones about it. I think this is the right way to do it. It, it is daft to start from scratch every time and build new systems. But we need to find a principled way of actually tackling and addressing the problem. And there are lots of issues. How do we understand the configuration possibilities? I'll show you some examples in a minute of a system with which I'm sure you've had some experience. Knowing what you can configure is not easy. It's particularly hard when it's not just one system that you're configuring, but you're configuring a set of software to work together to deliver some particular functionality. So knowing what you can configure is one thing. Understanding how to do it is a different problem, but is also incredible, maybe very difficult because you need both business knowledge and knowledge of the software itself. Predicting the consequences is very difficult. You, don't, you can change something which appears to be small and innocuous, and all of a sudden, dramatic things happen in your system. It stops working or works in a way which is completely different from what you expect. Now, that's true, of course, when you're dealing at a lower level in a programming language. But it's kind of more predictable a programming language. You can have mental execution models that we can follow. At this level, changing one parameter, all of a sudden, it's gone. And understanding a configuration, when you're presented with a configuration, what's in it? One of the things I've always been astonished by is the inability, if you have a PC, to actually say to this PC, tell me your configuration, please. Now, it knows its configuration. It has a thing called the registry where its configuration is defined. But if you actually want to see it, you have to plunge through menu after menu to discover it. And if you don't know what these menus are, you will never find this out. So actually, understanding a configuration is a very difficult problem. I'm going to use the example of Microsoft Word, which I'm sure you've all used. I tried to count the number of ways you could configure Word, and I, I can't be sure I've got them all. Okay, But there are at least seven ways in which you can configure Microsoft Word to do things for you. Okay, These, these, these are the different possibilities. And here's one of them. Understanding how to configure. Well, does all this mean? This is the, the preferences screen. This thing has contact tags ticked, you'll notice. Now, I have been using Microsoft Word for 20 years. Okay, I was a really early adopter of Microsoft Word. I, I used version 1. I have no idea what a contact tag is. Absolutely none. And there are other things in there. I don't know what happens if you untick them. And this is the easy bit. This is the easy screen. It's when you get into the other ones it gets really complicated. So to do that configuration, you need to know what you want to do from a text processing perspective, from the business perspective, but you also need to know the technicalities. And there's not a good match between these in many, many systems. This is very much the notion of this is in system language. And you have to understand how system language maps on to business language. Change. This process of change is a process of experimentation. It's actually one reason why kids are really good with new programs, because they're not frightened to experiment, and they have the time to just muck around with it and see what happens. There's no mental model which you could use. Well, there are lots of mental models which you can use, but they're unlikely to match the mental model of the software. That you can say, well, if I do this, this will happen. Okay? You actually ad hoc it. You, and then, of course, from that emerge gurus. People who have mystical knowledge and you ask them, what to, how do you do this? And they can't explain, but they can do it. So they, they, they type incantations into your computer and it changes. But there's no rationale between, for these incantations. So this configuration predictability is a real problem. How do you understand it? How do you understand the configuration once you've got it? Understanding software is actually pretty hard when you have a set of requirements and actually following these through to the design and the code in general is a pretty hard thing to do in, in all systems. But you can hypothesize that it's doable if you have enough time. But in 
Cut systems, we tend not to have properly documented requirements because we have a co-design process. We need to have knowledge of the configuration and knowledge of the system. We can't do change costing and impact analysis. To come back to our healthcare system, one of the problems, one of the things that took two years to establish was the menu structure of the system. Okay, because managers wanted one structure, clinicians wanted another. And it, it went from having 37 menu options to having three menu options to having 15 menu options. And each time it was supposed to take a few days and it ended up taking several months to change the menus for reasons that are completely unclear to me. But you can't actually say this simple change will take this amount of time because it's all opaque. So what are the challenges? Okay, As I said, I'm a believer in this approach to software engineering. I think this is the future because I think it makes sense to actually build on, stand on our shoulders instead of on our feet. But we need to have the community, the academic community, the industrial community, I think needs to establish methods, tools and techniques for systems engineering which will support this approach to development. We need to try, and this is a challenge for the academics, to discover principles. What can we say when we design systems? How can we have dependable configuration? We need to define processes and standards. This is an industrial problem for construction by configuration. And we need to methods and tools to support these processes. We need to say, how do we adapt our existing software engineering processes, largely predicated on the conventional software lifecycle, the V model, how do we adapt these for construction by configuration? So what are the principles? Now these are hypotheses of mine. It's work that I'm hoping to start on fairly soon, but it's not anything I can claim to have done. I think there's a principle of visibility, that it should always be possible to see a configuration, to make it explicit. There should be the principle of low coupling, which is a generally good design principle. Don't have things tightly coupled so that when you change one, it ripples through the whole system. We should reduce dependencies across configurations. We should address the problem of scalability. Often in these systems, the configuration of system deployment, so deployment in a particular operational environment, which may have five or may have 500 users, is mixed up with the configuration of the functionality. We should try and separate these so that we can configure a system, then scale it to an appropriate environment. And the principle of localization. How do we localize volatile configuration entities? These are not original principles. These are, these are just basically good software design principles. But we need to think how we can change, adapt, and apply them to COTS-based systems. We need approaches for visualization and analysis. As I said, we need something where you can actually go to your PC and say, show me how you're configured. We need to actually see the state of a system. We need to be able to do what-if analysis to explore that state without actually having to do changes to the system. I think that one of the key issues is to move the abstraction level of configuration from a system level to a policy level. Now, while configuration is a way of developing applications, and I've really been focusing on that, what we must also remember is that configuration is how we install our infrastructure. So when we have a computing infrastructure, we have to configure that. And the majority of security problems arise because of configuration errors and omissions. It's not properly configured. People don't apply patches or whatever. And consequently, failure to configure can cost an immense amount of money if we have to deal with these security problems. And I think that many of them arise because the security policy statement and the level of abstraction of configuration, there's a huge gap between these. This is how we want to have it secured, but how you actually do it there's no relationship between them. So I think we need to address this issue of policy description. How do we apply policy? How can we talk about policy in a particular setting? We need tools and methods to bridge this gap. We need to look at existing processes, the requirements processes, to separate the essential and the accidental. And that's 
quite a difficult political problem because often people are very wedded to the accidental and they're very reluctant to admit that what they do and what they want is not actually essential. How do we model configurations in such a way that we can reason about them? There's a, a whole approach to software engineering, model-based software engineering, which is generally inapplicable, which is predicated on the notion that we will carry on developing software the way we have been developing for the last 30 years. Now that's certainly true of some software systems, but I would like to argue that for the vast majority of commercial systems, model-based software engineering is a complete irrelevance because they will be building on SAP or Oracle or whatever. And then there's the problem of testing. How do we test against an incomplete specification? How do we, how do we assess test coverage? If we have a critical system, we want to be able to say, well, this is how we have tested it and we are confident that we've tested it in this particular way. It may not be good enough, but it's something. But how do you do a test coverage assessment in a, in a COT system? I don't know. The supporting processes, configuration management, existing tools work with source code. How do we adapt existing configuration management tools to work with configurations? Often which are interactive, remember. It's not that we have a file with the configuration defined in it. We have a, an interactive configuration process. How can we stop users making ad hoc changes? How do we only allow users to make changes that, that matter to them but don't matter more generally? What does high quality mean? What does quality mean when we're talking about configuration? All of these are challenges. Construction by configuration is a reality. There is no question that is how people are developing systems. And I believe that there's no question that it will be increasingly used for all classes of system. I don't think the way we do it is good enough. I think many of the benefits are illusory at the moment. And that we need to adapt our software engineering to fit the future. Thank you. Professor Somerville was asked the following five questions. Question 1. Are there any lessons to be learnt from the open source community in terms of the way they conduct business? I don't know. This is the kind of great white hope. You know, if, if, if everything becomes open source, that somehow magically they will become better. But, you know, I, I just find it really hard to envisage people getting enthusiastic about patient management systems and the way they get enthusiastic about Linux and there being a community of open source developers. I mean, you can get open source content management systems on the web. There's hundreds of them, I'm told. But open source depends on engaging a community and businesses. Businesses, A, will find it difficult to engage that community. And then, B, a lot of businesses' whole intellectual property is embedded in their software. They simply don't want to make it open source. It may well be that there are areas where that community can contribute, but I don't see it being the model for software development in the future. Question two. We appear to have an economic fight. Are there any tools a software engineer can bring to this fight? Well, I think that the tools of abstraction are the key issue. Can we have the abilities to go into an environment and do that abstraction to try and identify the accidental and the essential? And I think that is the, the key element. But communicating that is very, very difficult because, as I said, abstraction is alien to most disciplines. So it's particularly alien for people who don't do a science-based discipline, and which is most managers. I, mean, I have two daughters who have done arts degrees, and they have no idea what abstraction means. Absolutely no idea, because it is simply not part of their process. Question three. Have you any views on the granularity of the components that you use against the type of application domain that you are trying to put construction by configuration into? It's not like Lego, is it? No, no, it's, it's a much larger grain components. The components are really very big. I mean, something like SAP is huge. That's where the benefit comes from, of course. Because you're dealing with something that is very big, you're getting an awful lot of functionality. I mean, if you look at something like Microsoft Word, it gives you very, very fine grain control, and it becomes impossible to understand. To me, the essence is that we want to talk about policies. We don't want to talk about the details. And there's a huge gap between what you can do in terms of technical configuration and how you want to say this, this is what, how we really want to work, which is the policies. And I think that's the key challenge that we need to address. Question four. You mentioned the uncontrolled modification of software. Couldn't you limit the amount of configurability? Well, I, I think the problems that we saw in this particular system was that the, 
there were no mechanisms in the system to build in control. That is, the configurability wasn't protected. And as a consequence, technically ambitious consultants could actually do... There was no way to stop them doing it. Now, you're quite right. If You could easily, relative, in principle at least, build in mechanisms in a system to, to make configuration a protected action. And so you need to set in levels of permission. And lots of systems don't have that. You can often achieve that through normal power structures in an organisation. You can't change that. It's not your job to change that. You're exceeding your responsibility if you change that. Again, in a hospital, as I said, that doesn't work because the, the consultants, you literally can't sack them. You can't discipline them for doing that because they have a, a critical clinical function that you need. They're like professors in the uni conventional university. Certainly. They can, by and large, do what you like. There's very little that can be done to stop it. That's a kind of different from a business. In a business, that, I guess, wouldn't happen to the same extent because of the fact that you have a power structure in there, which is largely hierarchical rather than this funny-shaped power structure that you have in hospitals. Question 5. Architectural frameworks are getting a lot of attention in defence. Do you see much applicability to applications like this? Well, architectural frameworks are a kind of different class of problem in that. That's another kind of configuration problem where you, you have your architectural framework and you configure that framework to suit your particular application. I haven't really a lot of experience in working with that, so I can't really comment on it. But I would envisage that there will be common problems. <laughs> Professor Somerville can be contacted by email at ifs at dcs.st-and.ac.uk